Welcome to stories from the village of nothing much. Like easy listening, but for fiction. I'm Catherine Nikolai. I write and read all the stories you'll hear on the village of nothing much. Audio engineering and sound design is by Bob Wittersheim. I am a full-time daydreamer and storyteller, and I write conflict-free stories that help you feel good and connect to what is good in the world. Because even on dark days, there are good things happening. More will happen tomorrow. So come with me to the village of nothing much and stay as long as you like. And to start things off on the right foot, let's draw a deep breath in through the nose and sigh from the mouth. Let's do one more. Breathe in and let it out. Good. Our stories today celebrate the winter and the fresh start of a new year. We'll head downtown to peruse the stationery shop for supplies in A New Leaf, then bundle up for a long walk through the woods in All the Way Around the Lake. And finally, we'll clear off the dining room table and pass around the snacks and decks of cards in game night. A New Leaf. I'm not one for New Year's resolutions. After all, why wait for a specific day on the calendar to start something new? All the same, I like reflecting. I like having time to parse apart a thought or a feeling. And I like creating, sketching or writing and wandering and exploring. And the start of a new year is always ripe for that. So when I turn over a new leaf... It's more literal than figurative. I turn the leaf of a new book, or path on the trail, or song on a record. And this time around, my fresh start was all to do with a new planner. I still liked a physical paper planner, a pretty book in which to write my plans. I like looking at a whole month or week at a time, And setting down the dates, I'll do the things I mean to do. And last year's was full. I was out of pages, and after a year of being carried in my bag and brought out and put away so many times, the hard-bound edges were scuffed, and the ribbon for finding the day had been pulled out and lost. So a few days after the busyness of Christmas... I'd found myself on the street in front of one of my favorite shops, looking at the planners in the store window. This little shop sells some of the best things. They have shelves full of blank journals and notebooks, just waiting for you to write your great novel in. They have stationery in a hundred patterns with envelopes to match. They have sealing wax in a hundred colors and stamps with every letter. They have calendars, some silly with cats doing yoga, and some with the most lovely illustrations of tiny, sweet worlds that you can get lost in. And they have planners. I stepped in, out of the cold, and noticed the smell of the shop. A bit like a library, and a bit like a craft room. Actually, It smelled exactly like the library in my elementary school. Have you ever been stopped in your tracks by a scent that took you so powerfully back in time you have to shake your head to clear it? I remembered the worn blue carpeting, the tall stacks of books, and the feeling of excitement, wondering what was in all of them. I remembered pulling an old book off of a shelf in a back corner and sliding the card out of the paper pocket inside the front cover to see when it had been checked out last and by whom. I went to a tiny school, and it happened to be the same one my father had gone to as a child. And there on the card, 
A few rows from the top, in a child's handwriting, was his name. I guess in a small school, it wasn't such a coincidence that we should pick up the same book. But at the time, I remember standing stock still on that blue carpet, looking around with wide eyes, and wondering if the universe had just winked at me. I smiled at the memory and decided that, along with my planner, I would buy a card to send to Dad. I started browsing, and before I knew it, I had a little pile of goodies. Dad's card, a calendar to hang in the kitchen, a fresh pack of pencils, I could hardly wait to sharpen them, a packet of origami papers, my new planner, which had all the features I liked, plus a built-in pocket to store some notes, and a few pages of stickers in the back. Was I too old for stickers, I asked myself. Never, I answered. And lastly, only one new journal. I had so many, and I'd made myself a promise that I wouldn't buy any more till I filled up the ones I already had. So I only got one. A friendly face at the register rung me up and slipped all my purchases into a bag. As I stepped back out onto the winter street with it, I thought of the projects I could try out in the new year, and I walked a few blocks making plans in my head. I walked past a diner with booths lining the window and noticed an empty one away from the door. Perfect. I slipped in and pointed to the booth, and a waitress waved me over to it. I ordered a cup of coffee and laid my new planner on the Formica table. I took out my old one, along with a new pencil and my sharpener. I'd had a moment just like this a year ago, the changing of the guard. I wrote my name and number in the new book, slid my flat palm over the fresh pages, and spun through them, filling in birthdays and appointments and ideas. The waitress came back to warm up my coffee, and she smiled down at my scattered books and pages. Oh, I love a new planner at New Year's, she said. Me too, I agreed. She went back to her work, and I sipped coffee, and I wrote out Dad's card. I looked through the pages of the wall calendar, marveling at the illustrations. I looked ahead to next year's Thanksgiving and Christmas, checking where they would land, as if I were really planning that far ahead. I guess I was just looking for reasons to daydream about the year to come. The street was getting dark now, and I started packing my things up. The waitress dropped off my bill, and as I was taking out a few dollars to pay it, I thought suddenly about finding Dad's name in that book in the library all those years ago, and feeling like it was a little present that had been put into my hands. I took the blank journal, the one I wasn't supposed to buy anyway, and slipped a sheet of stickers into the front cover and left it with the money on the table and went out. Across the bill, I'd written, Happy New Year. All the way around the lake. I was nearly there, taking the last few turns down the dirt roads, on the far side of the orchard out nearly to the county line road. Snow had fallen steadily for the last day or so, and while the skies were still low and gray, the wind had gone and the day felt bright. We often say to each other, when clouds blanket the sky, where did the sun go? But of course, it hasn't gone anywhere. It persists, steadily sending its warmth and light, even when we cannot see it. I'd been forgetting things like that lately, and it was laying me low when I was looking at the world through the darkest, most smudged lens a friend, hearing the heaviness in my voice over the phone, asked when the last time was that I'd been outside for a good, 
long walk. I stopped to think and felt my face break into a smile. I almost laughed, seeing clearly for the first time in a few days. Thank you, was all I said back, and hung up the phone and went to find my boots. I turned into the lot, just a clear, plowed space off the side of the road, with a dozen cars parked in it. As I stepped out onto the frozen gravel, I made sure I had my hat, my mittens, my muffler pulled over my chin, and then felt into my pockets for other necessities. A lip balm and a pack of tissues for the effects that this lovely, fresh cold air would have on my nose. I had everything I needed and set off down the trail toward the lake. Immediately, just being outside, I felt better. I took deep breaths of the piney, icy air, and it felt like a vitamin hitting my system, instantly boosting my mood and energy. The path went through the woods for a while, and I stopped now and then to look up at the hundreds of bare branches against the sky. I saw bundles of twigs and leaves tucked into the crooks of tree boughs. Avian summer homes now shuddered for the season. Black squirrels, their thick, fluffy tails dancing behind them, were checking their inventory. Up one tree, across to another, down to the roots, and then digging in the snow. The path turned, and there was the lake. Another dose of what I'd been missing. I stopped to take in a long look. There was an edge of ice along the shore, a yard or so wide. It was bright, and white with heaps of snow, and the water beside shone dark against it. Out in the middle of the lake was a tiny island, only as big around as a kitchen table, but with one tall paper birch tree standing on it. These trees with their thin, flat bark tend to attract folks with pocket knives who feel the need to carve in initials and dates. Even the oldest graffiti in the world, in tombs in Egypt, in labyrinths in Sudan, carved on stone walls of basilicas and Smyrna, mostly just say, so-and-so was here. It seems to be a universal compulsion to leave a mark. Still, I was glad that paper birch was safe from all of that out there, where it could drop its seeds to be carried on the water to some other fertile place. It seemed to me that planting a seed was a better way to leave a mark than carving a scar. The lake scent of water and cold felt clear and clean in my nose and lungs. I kept walking. I was going all the way around the lake today. It would take an hour or more, and that was fine with me. I passed a family walking with their dogs, and we smiled at each other from behind our scarves. Their dogs looked built for cold weather with thick fur and broad chests and pulled their people forward, their eager paws digging into the snow like they were pulling a sleigh. The path turned back into the woods for a bit, and scattered across it were a few fallen branches from a pine tree. I think it is the very best scent in the world, fresh pine. And I felt so incredibly lucky to be just where I was right then. I nearly laughed aloud at how far my mood had shifted just by spending a little time outside. Walking in the snow felt a bit like walking in sand. And while I knew that was good therapy for my legs, I reminded myself I wasn't on a deadline and walked slower and spent more time just looking at the landscape. The lake came back into view and here it was solid ice with geese and ducks walking and sitting on the surface. They honked and quacked at each other or sat unbothered by the cold and turned their faces to the dim light of the sun behind the clouds. Among the mallards was one white farm duck. Every year I looked for him, a standout in the crowd, 
and the only member of his flock I could certainly identify. But still, I would eagerly search for him each spring. I hadn't found him this year, and hoped he was just watering at another lake, or that I was missing him by chance on my walks. Now, here he was, and I was so glad to see him. Maybe that's silly, or maybe it's the very best human instinct to check on others, even strangers, to see that they have made it safely back home. I was more than halfway around the lake now and came to a spot free from ice where the water flowed. There was a bridge made of stones and mortar that spanned a section of the lake where it split off into another. In the summer, you could look down to see a shoal of carp with silver bellies each two or three feet long, floating lazily in the shallows. I stood, listening to the water as it rushed under the bridge, dropping into the lower lake behind me. There's some magic about bridges, isn't there? It's where you fall in love at first sight in a movie. Where you stand to toss over a corked bottle with a secret inside, or pensively skim stones. And if you were walking across a bridge on a summer night, just as a bloom of fireworks streaked the sky above you, would you ever forget it? Whether it is made of steel girders 270 feet up with tugboats and freighters passing underneath, or planks of creaking wood in a dense forest, or stones and mortar over hibernating carp. There is something about crossing a bridge that takes you out of your head and drops you right back into your body. I was nearing the end of my walk. Another 10 minutes now and I'd be back to my car. I was warmed up from the exercise, but felt the chill in my feet and in the tip of my nose. I'd needed a tune-up, and I'd gotten one. I was recalibrated and ready to go back. I'd take off my layers and make a huge cup of hot chocolate and settle down in my chair that faces the backyard. I'd lift my cup to my lips and blow at the steam and look at the red glow behind the clouds and remind myself that even when I can't see it, the light is there. Game night. The tree was still up, and we still had plates of cookies, decorated with red and green icing, and plenty of leftover holiday cheer. While the days before the 25th were full of that lovely anticipation that only happens once a year, the days immediately after felt like a deep sigh of relaxation. Everything was done. And now we could just enjoy a bit of time before we put our ducks in a row for the coming year. A few years back, we'd started a tradition for the 31st, and it had stuck. We'd had our fair share of glamorous New Year's Eves, nights out, dancing into the wee hours, coming home with confetti in our hair and crumpled noisemakers in the pockets of our coats. At some point, that kind of celebration had slipped down the other side of the hill and gone from exciting to exhausting. And that's when we started game night. We'd invite half a dozen or so friends, make a big buffet of snacks, and clear off the dining room table to make space for fun. Remember fun? When we were kids, we woke each day with a deep-seated need and an insatiable appetite for it. We sought it out and often found it a hundred times a day. We made up games in an instant, played them until we thought up a better one, then played that. Game night always reminded me how vital fun was, 
how good it felt to laugh until my cheeks hurt. And now, instead of waking up bleary-eyed and headachy on New Year's Day, I was guaranteed to wake up feeling like a kid again. We had a bit of cleaning up to do before our guests arrived, and we divvied up the jobs. There was firewood to be brought in, food to prepare, and a few scraps of wrapping paper still kicking around under the sofa in the living room to be picked up. I volunteered for kitchen-related chores and left my better half to attend to the rest. I always opted to be in the kitchen if I could. It never felt like work to me. Not when I could turn on some music and dance around in my socks and chop and saute and wind up with something delicious in the end. I started by making a soup, something thick and hearty for a cold winter night. I took a couple leeks from the fridge. I thought they looked like green onions that had grown up and lived adult lives now. I sliced them into coins and dropped them into a colander to rinse in the sink. Leeks are grown in sandy soil and need to be washed carefully before they're cooked. Some might find that a pain, but I actually liked all the small, fiddly parts of cooking. Dicing things into even pieces, snipping herbs from stems, and even washing leeks. Once they were squeaky clean, I sautéed them in the bottom of my giant soup pot with olive oil and a pinch of salt. While they cooked down, I overturned a bag of golden potatoes onto the counter and started peeling and chopping. Then in with the potatoes and broth and fresh thyme and black pepper. I had a grandfather who believed wholeheartedly in the healing properties of black pepper, and I always added an extra pinch for him. I set the soup to simmer away and turned to the next task. The soup would be perfect to serve up in cups between rounds, but we also needed finger foods that wouldn't interrupt our very important play. For this, I made mahamara, a delicious dip of Syrian origin that felt pretty fancy, but came together in a flash. It was made with roasted red peppers, walnuts, breadcrumbs, chili flakes, and pomegranate molasses, all blended together in my food processor. It was a beautiful, rich red color, and I spooned it into a few bowls, which I could set around the table, surrounded by fresh veggies and toasted flatbread. The soup was nearly ready, and our friends were expected soon, and I had one more thing to make. It was a treat, a bit rich in flavor, but one of those snacks that folks just can't leave alone. Truffle popcorn. I popped a huge pot of popcorn, and when the kernels stopped pinging in the pan, I tipped all the hot, fluffy pieces into a big brown paper bag. I drizzled truffle oil in a thin stream over the corn and added a good pinch of pink salt. Then I folded over the top of the bag and shook it for all I was worth. I heard the fire crackling in the grate and had a feeling I was being watched in my dance of the truffle corn fairy, but I didn't mind. How's that fire going? I called out and just heard a laugh. I tipped the popcorn into a few bowls and set them out with the muhammara. I stuck a few stacks of napkins around the place and turned on some music. I hit a few bottles of bubbly for toasting the new year, and I pushed open the door from the kitchen out to the backyard and stuck them neck deep into the nearest snowdrift. This is a handy part of living somewhere with plenty of snow. Any snowbank can be an extension of your refrigerator. As I was coming back in to stir the soup, I heard a friendly knock and the jingle bells on the front door ringing as our friends began to pile in. Oh, the loveliness of having friends, dear and old enough to treat your home as their own. As soon as coats were hung up and hugs exchanged, they were reaching into cupboards for glasses, knowing just where the corkscrew and bottle openers were and setting themselves down at the table, rolling up their sleeves and getting ready to play. I turned off the soup and set the lid ajar to let it cool and poured myself a glass of something. 
the popcorn was disappearing, just like I knew it would. And everyone wanted to know what its secret ingredient was, but I was stubborn about sharing. It's special to my house. You'll have to come here when you crave it, I finally said, and set down a few board game boxes and decks of cards on the table as we debated what we'd play tonight. Last game night, I had taught them a card game that my family had played when I was young. And once everyone had caught on to its breakneck pace, we couldn't quit till nearly midnight. We called it Nutsy, or sometimes Peanuts, but I would heard it go by a dozen funny names, including the Racing Canfield, Peanuts, Pounce, Scramble, Squeal, and Scrooge. We all agreed after last time we had a few scores to settle and decided to make it another night of cards. We cleared away the boxes and passed around decks of cards and all started to shuffle. Card games had been a big deal in my family and I knew how to shuffle cards like a blackjack dealer by the time I was seven years old. And as I watched my friends mix and count out the first 13 of each deck, and pass them over to the person on their left. I had a strong memory of being the littlest one at the table with all my aunts and uncles, my feet not yet touching the ground as we set up our hands and waited with excitement for someone to shout, go. Then the sound of flipping cards, cards slapping onto the table and grown-ups elbowing each other out of the way to get that seven of spades onto the six. Now to be in my own home, my own family of friends, the smell of popcorn and soup in the air, and all of us grinning around the table at each other, drumming our fingers and waiting to turn the first card. I guess we'd probably forget the countdown to midnight, too busy laughing and playing. And then at some point run out into the snow to retrieve the champagne. We'd raise our glasses and make a resolution. This year, more fun. We hope you've enjoyed spending some time with us in the village of nothing much. We'll be back next week with more stories. And in the meantime, we wish you many glimmers of ordinary magic around every corner.